I'm here at the National Firearms Museum here in the William B. Ruger Gallery with Phil Schreier, the very, very tired out <laughs> senior curator. Because And the reason I'm saying that, Phil, is we just got back. I did a week in Vegas. You did, wow, how many weeks Eleven in Vegas? <laughs> Eleven days in yeah. Vegas, out there first at, at a collector's arm show, then at a, at a shot show. You had folks up at going up to the SCI show after that. You have been busy, 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 my friend. Well, we both have. In fact, we're wearing the same clothes we were two weeks ago for this show. So well, I, I ran out of clean clothes. <laughs> Come on. So you brought some beautiful displays, took some of the treasures from the National Farms Museum, and, and took them out on the road so more folks can see them. Tell us about this wonderful farm that you traveled with. Uh, John, we had a, a traveling exhibit that goes with us to the SHOT Show and the NRA annual show uh, called Real Guns of the Old West, which is uh, six of our favorite Hollywood Western firearms that were used in movies and TV. And uh, this particular piece, uh, we, we treasure fondly. It's, uh, you know, when you look at it, it's just really an Italian reproduction of a hawk and rifle. I mean, it's probably not worth 150 bucks. Um, and it's, it's just a typical, you know, thing you could get. But I have a feeling there's a butt here. There's a butt. There's, <laughs> there's a butt. There's what they call provenance. Ah. Uh, this gun comes from uh, the set of The Mountain Men, a movie night that was filmed in 1980, produced by Fraser Heston. If you recognize that last name, it's because his father was Charlton Heston, the star of the same film, along with Brian Keith. Great film. Great film. It's turned into a cult classic amongst the muzzle-loading set. And, uh, you know, there's one scene where he's shooting at the bad guys from uh, behind, a, a, you know, a bunch of driftwood on, on, the, uh, on the river, some snags, and, and they're just handing him guns one after another. And this passed through his hands, you know, for two seconds during the film. But it was long enough to grab a still and put it in the collection for the, uh, for the film. And it's something we're very proud to have of one of Mr. Heston's pieces. Tell us about this firearm. Well, like I said, it's just a uh, just an Italian reproduction. Uh, it's a uh, 45 caliber. It's uh, meant to be in the half stock tradition of a Hawk and Plains rifle. Uh, it's a lot lighter than any Hawken that was ever made. Uh, it's in flintlock, um, set up in flintlock configuration with a nice patch box. It's got some brass beads on it to give it a little bit of that frontier mountain man outpost you know, type of flavor. Uh, it, it is a, a true muzzle loader. Uh, they didn't skimp on that for the film. Uh, and, and to get it to fire, he actually had to, you know, hope it would go off when he pulled the trigger. But, you know, they're doing close-ups of all that. And, uh, you know, you can tell when a gun's being faked, uh, you know, for, the, uh, for flintlock. Uh, it's pretty easy. So, uh, you know, like I said, it's one of about 28 different, you know, rifles he used during uh, the movie. Uh, but we're proud to have one of them. And it's neat. You bring up a good point. What they do with these firearms, half the time, you know, when you're talking about movie firearms, it's a crazy conglomeration of parts or this or that and, and adding this and doing this. And then the props guys got them and everyone else. And, and, and it's always funny to see them in, in the flesh here, if you would, to see what they really are. It's pretty neat. It is, it is very neat, uh, you know, to, to play with them. You know, we learn so much about movies from uh, dealing with the various props and how easily we're deceived visually by different things. Uh, uh, you know, I know Dylan back there really likes the Star Wars. So we got a lot of that coming in in the next step, you know, the next exhibit here in the Ruger Gallery. Uh, but when you look at some of this stuff, you go, Wow, and it's really cheap, you know. This was put together with spit and wood screws, but on, you know, on the screen it looked right. great. But, you know. And, and, and then it's a whole different deal when you need a working firearm. It, it, then, then that's a, because you said some of the stuff you can't fake, so you need a firearm no matter what you do to it, that'll operate too. You need it to go bang. Uh, you know, a lot of CGI and, and audio guys can fix some of that, but, uh, you know, you really need a gun to go off. You can't, you know, act recoil. Uh, yeah. too, too convincingly. Uh, and, and, you know, you're dealing with uh, modern guns, semi-automatics, uh, gas-operated stuff. There's got to be a way to make those work. You know, it's one thing to fire blank out of a muzzle loader, uh, but to fire blanks that actually build up enough pressure to cycle the slide and to work a, uh, an automatic uh, mechanism, that's very difficult. Uh, the armorer's job on a movie set is quite involved. And another aspect with this, different than maybe another prop, is a safety issue, too, because you want to make sure 
that no one in, in using this operating, whether you're shooting a blank or just what, no matter what you're doing, that people are safe because we always are, you know, safety is paramount around firearms, whether they're movie firearms or, or any other kind. Well, that's exactly right. I mean, within our own generation, John Eric Hexum and Brandon Lee were both, uh, you know, fatally injured on the set of films or TV shows that they were doing with, you know, with prop guns uh, because safety uh, even with guns that just fire blanks, is still uh, their guns, and uh, they, they need to be treated as if they were loaded at all times. Point in a safe direction, finger off the trigger. Uh, you know, all, all the you know everything that we teach here at the NRA, whether it's a movie prop or you're out on the firing line, you got to keep that number one all the time. Absolutely. Now that your feet are back here in Fairfax on terra firma, tell us a little bit how people can come and see these treasures here at the National Farms Union. And if, and if you can, we'll talk a little bit about your fantastic new website as well. <laughs> well, thank you, John. Yes, of course, we're just about 15 miles outside of Washington, D.C., uh, located in Fairfax County, Virginia, uh, at the intersection of U.S. Route 66 and uh, Route 50. Uh, we're open uh, Sunday through Friday. Uh, 930 to 5 and Saturdays 930 to 7. Uh, free admission, plenty of parking. Uh, if you can't make it to Fairfax, uh, we've got a wonderful new website we'd like you to check out at, uh, at nramuseum.org. And uh, uh, it's got some great stuff. You can even see some of our uh, of our best ofs uh, in the archives back there and go over some of the guns that we, uh, we, we've visited here on what's now been over a year of Curator's Corners. It's been a real pleasure. Wow, it's been great, Phil, and we're very excited about the upcoming week. We, we, really, we were talking about this before we got on the air here about how much fun it was to do Phil Noir, but we, we've raised the bar, Phil, so now we got to come up with something just to really top that. So we're, we're, we're going to put our heads together here and we're going to come up with something pretty neat. I think we're working on some good ideas. I see a deep trench in mustard gas in your future, John. <laughs> Just another day in my household. <laughs> Phil Schreier, thank you for being here. Thanks for being here and all over the country for the folks here uh, so they can share these treasures from the National Farms Museum. We appreciate you and Jim's and all the curators work here at the National Farms Museum. Thank you, sir, and we'll see you next week for another edition of Curator's Corner. Thank you, John, and thanks very much for allowing us uh, to be a part of your family here. Appreciate it.